Hi, you guys. Hello. Um, so I have a, a bunch of little businessy things. Next week we have uh, on next Wednesday, March fourteenth at seven, we have Carl Safina, who is a w winner of a MacArthur Genius Award. He's an environmental writer, the host of PBS's Saving the Ocean, a Stony Brook professor, and um, his book, his most recent book, is called The View from Lazy Point. Um, at 6.30 next week, for those of you who are not in the program now, um, or, yeah, yes, um, there will be, <laughs> sorry, it's <laughs> a little technicality, um, there will be an info session on the Southampton Arts Summer, which is basically the, our very large and wonderful program f uh, in pretty much every discipline that you might want to study in the arts, everything from theater and film and visual arts to our more usual offerings of fiction, poetry, personal essay, memoir, and children's lit. And Carla, who is here, uh, can talk to anybody who's interested in finding out more about that. Um, and there are flyers around at the entrance. So uh, tonight we have a really uh, wonderful uh, guest who has disappeared. Yeah. Where are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we had a really wonderful. Yes. Yes. We had a surprise guest. There's um, um, Hillary Thayer Hammond, who is uh, the author of Anthropology of an American Girl. So let's welcome. Her. Great. I ran away. Okay. All right. I'll navigate. Thanks. Um, I should start by saying that can you hear everybody can hear me I'm okay somebody really great from this program called me tonight and asked me if they could see an advanced copy of my speech and I was like I don't even have a speech <laughs> so I wrote one really fast so I have it written down I don't know I was like wow do people do speeches so it's not really a speech it's just collected thoughts and I told Susie I get really nervous talking in public so I'm sorry if I get like quaky uh, first, thank you to the Stony Brook Southampton Writing and Literature Program. I was actually a student here for the uh, screenwriting program a few summers ago, and it was really great. I don't know if you're connected, but yeah, we you are. The same thing. Yeah, it was really, I was, it was great, it, really good. Um, and thank you to Susie for reaching out, and actually that means getting through because I've been living completely off the grid for the past few months writing full-time, day and night, and never leave the house. The phones are unplugged. The dog bites. The <laughs> everything is like internet, you know, detached. So it came like via lunar landing. Um, the, I can't believe anybody got through. I thought I had this barbed wire, all these defenses, and actually she got through. So uh, I was reminded that I still exist, so thank you. <laughs> and that's a good message for th those of you who need to operate off the grid at some point. The world will wait. Uh, so I'm happy to be here for multiple reasons. Um, I get to talk to writers about writing, which is a nice change from actually writing, which is like most of you know, watching the grass grow. Um, I'm the author of Anthropology of an American Girl, which most of you know. I'm also the author of uh, and editor of uh, a nonfiction uh, science and art book called Categories on the Beauty of Physics. And um, the reason I mention it is that both were published by um, an independent company of which I was co-owner. So after I do a reading, I think I can talk about um, the differences between independent publishing and mainstream publishing, and that might be a unique perspective for you guys to, uh, to, to have, to hear from, whatever. Um, so uh, before I, I should say also that my publisher is Spiegel and Grau, which is a division of Random House, and they're really great. Um, so, uh, I can also talk to uh, the challenges of writing under pressure, uh, 
under pressure of deadline and uh, to you know to to the public as opposed to the the way I wrote the first time, which was just for myself, and that I think is also maybe of interest um, about anthropology. So it's been described as a coming of age, and that's like the simplest description. In more complex terms, uh, as a semi-autobiographical coming of age about a young woman growing up in Reagan era America. Um, for me, it's today what it was from the very beginning, which is a study of the micro and the macro. So thus the, world's, the words anthropology and girl. Um, I was inspired to write it after taking graduate anthropology courses uh, and ethnographic filmmaking courses at NYU. And in that field, it's really critical to consider the politics of representation. The word politics here doesn't refer to the politics of culture at large, though there's always that. Um, specifically, it concerns more manageable entities like the state of mind of the filmmaker, the state of mind of the viewer, and the mindset of the object under consideration, the person or the, the subject matter. So uh, the field has this really long and fascinating um, history of applied theory and revision to theory and a lot of interaction that I'm not really authorized to get into, but it's, it's great it's great to look to investigate because a lot of things come up um, that uh, in regard to to fairness and and there's an urgency to fairness that I think that that field has a unique um, uh, perspective on. So what appealed to me was the uh, as a writer was the um, immediacy of access, the directness of line, and the purity of purpose that. Uh, an anthropologist needs to bring to the project, and I tried to uh, take that away and bring it into writing. And my challenge with anthropology was um, how to describe the emotional life of an American teenager on the threshold of adulthood in a really kind of wonky era um, without resorting to stereotype. So um, without having an audience and without having a publisher, I was able to go slow, thus the length. Um, it served me at the time. I mean, I think it allowed me to kind of talk around things um, which suited my project. So uh, it evolved organically and, you know, it is what it is. And then it was picked up um, by <coughs> Uh, Spiegel and Grau after um, having been published by me and this company that I, that I had and uh, got changed around a little bit which we can talk ab about also um, and it's had a whole kind of second life which is which is great so uh, I'll do a reading from the book and then we can you guys can ask questions later Um, so the story is, I don't know if many or any of you have read it, but um, it takes place largely out here. It's sort of <clears throat> not exactly a story of my life, but it, it, is, uh, it works in tandem with my life. So, I mean, everyone says the first time you write a book, that's really what so many people resort to. Um, it's also the Hamptons in New York City, so it had interest, I think, broader appeal. Um, the girl is uh, an artist, and she's um, got a particularly quirky take on the world. And, um, you know, uh, the kind of normal things that happen to young women, we kind of take as monumental. So um, I just had to walk really, you know, baby steps through all of those processes rather than be like, oh my god, I'm in love or something. So it seemed more truthful and more... Um, True to her, I guess. Not truthful, necessarily. So in this scene, she's at home, and the person that she's in love with comes into the house. And these are her perceptions on that. Uh, OK. Chapter 18. I dreamt it was a paper doll. I was one in a row of paper doll cutouts, sitting on a swing set. We wore triangular lime green dresses and had shoulder-length flip hair, like from the 60s. 
At lunchtime, I tried to draw the dream, but I couldn't. Beyond the doll bodies, there had lain a sleepy hint of magic, something astral and sublime that continued to insinuate itself upon me like an ocular echo. After school, I rummaged through my mother's Bossa Nova records. There were ones by Gilberto, Getz, Jobim. I finally settled on Getz, Gilberto because it had Astrid Gilberto singing Corcovado. I stripped down to my long johns, leaving my clothes in a pile near the hearth, and I listened to the song, closing my eyes to reconstitute the dream's elusive vitality, its lightness and lift. The song was delicate and de-emphasized, melodious and modern, serene and insurgent, similar to the feel of my dream. It was feminine, but also civic and political. The women on the swings had been separate and connected. It would not have been possible to extract one without collapsing the whole. It was the way women used to be in the 1960s, or maybe just the way I imagined them to be. It occurred to me that I couldn't draw the dream but I should try to cut it. So I got a stack of paper from the basement and some sewing scissors from Kate's room. Then I returned to the fireplace. By the time I heard the rain, it was after six o'clock. Frozen drops were making a spreading sound on the roof like nickels on a tent. I once proposed a study of the water cycle for a science fair. I wanted to draw attention to the beauty of the rain. Everyone always just complains about it. Nick Kraft, the earth science teacher said, no way, do not try to make rain. He recommended a tidal wave or a volcano. Tragedy is much more fun, Nick told me. You buy some glue and plastic doodads at the five and 10 and create a theater of disaster. I wasn't surprised by his response. In high school, the study of the earth is pretty much the study of maps and catastrophe, as though the only possible points of interest are border wars and devastation. It's similar in other subjects. History is the history of battle. Language is the study of English, and science is an excuse to play with acid and cut frogs. If you're waiting for some creative digression into the rhetoric of math or the zoology of conquest, you'll be waiting a really long time. I spread my legs as wide as possible and folded another sheet of paper into re rectangular strips. I've been having trouble with the hairstyles. They weren't flipping properly. In my dream, the hair had been weightless, curling up and in with party kinks. I often dreamt of long hair, now that my own hair was so short, though never before of happy, bouncing hair. Suddenly the room darkened, the sky turned to ash. Wind discharged against the picture window in erratic gusts, and there was an itinerant commotion. Sounds of people running through rain, voices caught in pockets. The front door blew open with a slam, and Kate came through, her body huddled against the water. Her acting partner, Tim, followed, urging her in, going, come on, come on, come on. Tim stomped his feet and shook his head like a two-legged dog. It was funny to think of him that way, as though he were standing upright with difficulty, as though he would have been better served on all fours. He removed his shoes and crossed directly to the fire, stepping over me. I drew my papers into the pocket of my legs. The door did not close. It was braced by a hand. Rourke's. In one giant stride, he moved from the porch to the plank floor, when he passed under the doorframe, he had to lower his head. His eyes found mine easily, as though he expected me to be exactly where I was. Hey, he said, and I said, hey. He dried his feet and smiled shyly. I saw the edge of his perfect teeth and the dimple on the right side of his face, which was a furrow like a pen puncture. I returned to my work, though I continued to regard him from beneath the hood of my head. He unzipped his jacket, and there he was, in my tiny house. It was like having a constellation down from the sky. It was raining too hard for me to walk, Kate said. Now it's raining too hard for them to drive. You can just put your coat over there, she told Rourke, referring to the couch back as she turned on the desk lamp. The incandescence blanched the firelight. I flinched. Sorry, she said, smiling tightly and rolling her eyes, adding, Evie hates lights. Rourke scrutinized my mother's bookshelves, the exhausted textbooks and frayed novels, the thumbtacked newspaper clippings and the, and the loose nudes on cocktail napkins. How small the house seemed with him in it, how steeped with color and congested with effects. It was like a feast or a carnival, the ceiling seemed to swag. His eyes lingered on a white wooden sailboat I'd built in my dad's shop when I was five, and he lifted it. Feeling the canvas triangle, crisp with paint, running one finger across the name printed on the block bottom, Eveline. It was nice that he looked for me there. No one had ever looked for me there. Kate invited them into the kitchen. 
Tim hopped right off the hearth, but Rourke remained, continuing to scan the shelves in silence. When she called him once again, he moved to join them, first turning off the desk lamp that Kate had put on, his hand lingering on the switch, his back to me. I looked for new music. I'd lost interest in bossa nova. The woman Rourke awakened in me was not gifted with delicacy or political cause. She came in an atomic rush, possessing nothing more than instinct and courage. I chose Al Green's Here I Come, Here I Am, Come and Take Me. The song played the way I felt, knowing but new, secretive but open. Lines from the song, I can't believe that it's real the way that you make me feel, a burning deep down inside, a love that I cannot hide. Rourke's jacket was across the room. I resisted as long as I could, and then I crawled to the couch. My hand felt the leather. In the kitchen, they chatted capably, as though they'd been brought together by choice rather than chance. Actually, Rourke was saying, I took a costume design course in college. You're kidding, Kate giggled. Tim said, why not, Kate? It was probably an easy A. Not quite, I almost failed. Oh, shit, Tim groaned. There goes the GPA. I asked the teacher if there was anything I could do to bring up the grade, and she said, as a matter of fact, Mr. Rourke, there is. I'll give you the weekend to make a wedding dress. There was an explosion of laughter. No, Tim said, the bitch. What did you do, Kate asked. I made a wedding dress. Did your grade go up? I got an A, he said, in several marriage proposals. They laughed again and then moved into a discussion of politics and sports and classic cars. Rourke talked about the upcoming election and President Carter and the Soviet Union and Afghanistan and the boycott of the Winter Olympics. Coming from his voice with its rich cadence, worldly things did not seem so petrifying. It intrigued me the way he excelled socially, the way he spoke that language, but also mine. If I was sorry not to know more about current events, I was consoled by the fact that I could mold a finch from clay and recount in detail the aroma of a half-dead oak leaf, but possibly all that counted for nothing. One by one, I burned my cutout attempts. The doll made a contorted lattice on the logs, leaping eerily to puppet-like existence, contracting to pitiful cinders. It was like a breath, like breathing life into, like sucking it out again. There was this place in the middle where they looked best, and that was the place of my dream. A single sheet of paper remained. I folded it, then cut without penciling, my body reaching for each new inch, going by sense of feeling. And as I went, I kept thinking, it's not the chime of the bell, it's the echo of the chime. To make the inner openings around the bodies and swings, I used an exacto knife, unfocusing my eyes, steering through resistant folds. Just as I made the final incision and the curious remains dropped to the floor, the glow of the firelight darkened. What are you making, he asked. Work spoke with care as though aware in advance of the difficulties he might face. He wanted me to know he regretted using words on me so soon after using words on them, and that the words reserved for me were different words. His caution was not inappropriate. Somehow, I felt I'd been lied to. He squatted, his knees coming to the height of my shoulders. He allowed me to examine him, letting my eyes go slowly over. In his willingness to be searched and to be seen, in his conscious quietude, I perceived his resolve. I had the feeling of being a cat to catch. Once Powell taught me to catch cats. We were at the tracks, crouching to lure a stray kitten, build trust, he instructed, hardly moving his lips, gesture slowly. Work's arms ventured off his legs. They reached into my vicinity, then they paused. When I did not pull back, they came farther. He took the paper from me, and I let him. I had a dream, I said, speaking because he willed me to. I was a cutout on a swing. From each end of the chain, he grasped a doll's hand, a fist, really, there were no fingers, and gently he pulled. The hair was perfect. He smiled, which one are you? I stared widely, which side is the front? This side, he said, the side facing him. I pointed to the third from the right, this is me. Dishes clattered in the kitchen, I startled, but he did not move, except to reassign his weight to the opposite leg. He seemed disinclined to give my dolls back. Maybe he was going to take them away. But instead, he released them reluctantly into my reluctantly receiving hands. And there was a single second during which we each held one end of the dolls. And in that second, I felt a riveting and arduous bliss. No more hail, he said, looking out the window. Then he stood. Though I was sitting, I felt I might topple without him there. My hand grabbed the floor. 
See you soon, he pledged confidentially as his arms entered the sleeves of his jacket. Yes, I said, pledging to you, soon. What were you two talking about, Kate asked as we watched Rourke's car pull out onto the street. The headlights scanned her face through the window and implications of raindrops slithered across her cheeks, skulking left to right like legions of obedient insects. I thought of an old detective movie, The Big Sleep or The Maltese Falcon. Kate and I had come to inhabit a menacing realm of extremes, shadows and light, desire and aversion, faith, betrayal, wins, losses, and in that realm we were liars, each of us. Nothing, I said, the rain. Kate hoped I was friendly, at least. I told her I thought I was. She fell back onto the couch. I can't believe he was actually here. Neither can I, I said, agreeing. It felt good to agree with Kate. It had been a long time. So that's one scene. Mm -hmm. um, it's up to you. I can read more, or I can turn it over to you guys. Any? I'd love to hear some more. Yeah? Are you the only one, though? Is there a my, my <laughs> like, uh, OK, so I'm, I haven't read this in like a million years. I'm really sorry. This is, I don't even know when I did all this labeling. Thank God it's so convenient. But um, it's a hard book to read from because it's, um, it's mushy. But uh, let me just see. Has any, anyone read it? Are there any requests? Or <laughs> uh, So um, well, I don't want to do a spoiler. Why don't you read something from very early? Early? Because yeah. I think we talk a lot about beginnings. You know. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Hmm. OK. Um, I'd love to hear how you started. Sure, I can do that. Well, it's difficult to start. I wanted to start with, um, so in anthropology, we talked a lot about people from other cultures. And so questions for me were like, how did I get here? And how am I represented? And what do I appear to be versus what I feel myself to be? And so I wanted to start with just a girl. And I wanted to start with two girls. And I wanted to start with um, the way that that friendship between two girls is really threatened at the point of, you know, when men start to come in the picture. So you, you build up all this intimacy and then you just lose it and then you share it with someone else. So that's where it starts. She and her best friend Kate are um, riding bikes at Georgica Beach in East Hampton. So chapter one, uh, Kate turned to check the darkening clouds and the white arc of her throat looked long like the neck of a preening swan. We pedaled past the mansions on Lily Pond Lane, and the sky sat down, resting its gravid belly against the earth. Hurry, she called through the clack of spokes. Rain's coming. She rode faster, and I did also, though I liked the rain and the changes it wrought. Nothing is worse than the mixture of boredom and anticipation, the way the two twist together, breeding malcontentedly. I opened my mouth to the mist, trapping some of the raindrops that were just forming, and I could feel the membranes pop as I passed, which was sad, like breaking a spider's web. Sometimes you can't help but destroy the intricate things in life. At Georgica Beach, we sat on the concrete step of the empty lifeguard building. The bicycle's leg collapsed at our ankles, rear wheels lightly spinning. Kate lit a joint and passed it to me. I drew from it slowly. It burned my throat, searing and disinfecting it, making me think of animal skins tanned to make teepees. Indians used to get high, and when they did, they felt high, just the same as me. Still do get high, I corrected myself. Indians are not extinct. What did you say? Kate said. Nothing, I said, just thinking of Indians. Her left foot and my right foot were touching. They were the same size, and we shared shoes. I leaned forward and played with the plastic-coated tip of her sneaker lace, poking it into the rivet holes of my tree torns as the rain began to descend half-heartedly before us. In my knapsack, I found some paper and a piece of broken charcoal, and I began to sketch Kate. The atmosphere conformed to her bones the way a pillow meets a sleeping head. I tried to recall the story of the cloth of St. Veronica, something about Christ leaving his portrait in blood or sweat on a woman's handkerchief. I imagined the impression of Kate's face remaining in the air after she moved away. You know what I mean? She was asking, 
and she freed a frail, frail charm from her turtleneck, a sea for Catherine, lavishly scripted. Yes, I do, I said, though I wasn't really sure. I only probably knew what she meant. Often our thoughts would intertwine, and in my mind I could see them, little threads of topaz paving a tiny Persian byway. My hand sawed across the paper I was sketching on, moving mechanically because that's the way to move hands when you're high and sitting in an autumn rain. Autumn rains are different from summer ones. When I was seven, there were lots of summer rains, or maybe seven is just the age when you become conscious of rain. That's when I learned that when it rains in one place, it doesn't rain all over the world. My dad and I were driving through a shower, and we reached a line where the water ended. The sun rays windmilled down, and our faces and arm, arms turned gilded pink, the color of flamingos. Or was it flamingos? Flamingos, Kate corrected. Flamenco is a type of dance. I remember spinning around in the front seat of the car to see water continuing to fall behind us on the highway. That was the same year I learned that everyone gets glasses eventually, and there's no beginning to traffic. The last thing bothered me a lot. Whenever I got into a car, I used to think today might be the day we reached the front. <clears throat> I stood and gave Kate my hand. Let's go to the water. She stood too, wiping the sand off the back of her jeans, half turning to check herself. We walked our bikes to the crest of the asphalt lot and leaned them against the split rail fence. The sea was bloated with the tide. It was dark and thick on top. You could tell that underneath there was churning. A hurricane was forming off the coast of Cuba and Cuba isn't far from where we lived on the south shore of Long Island, not in terms of weather. I stripped down to my underwear and t-shirt and left my clothes in a pile. Kate did the same. The water was purplish and rough and it knocked against me, setting me off balance. It felt good to succumb. Sometimes you get tired, always having to be so strong in yourself. Dad said that in Normandy during World War II, soldiers had to climb from ships into the sea and then onto the shore. They'd waded through the ocean with packs on their backs and guns in their arms. He hadn't fought in Normandy. He just knew about it because he knows lots of things and he's always reading. He said the men had to get on the beach and kill or be killed. It's one thing to say you're willing to die for your country, but it's another thing to have to do so when the moment actually presents itself. I could not have imagined Jack or Denny or anyone from my class dying to defend America, though everyone said that war was coming and also the draft, just like with Vietnam. The Russians are crazy, people said. This time it's going to be nuclear. This time we're going to go in one atomic blush. Kate came alongside me. God, this water is black. My mother refuses to go into the ocean. She respects it, she says, which is basically the same thing as saying she's afraid. I go in because it scares me, because certain fears are natural, and it's good to distract yourself from the unnatural, more terrifying kinds. The ocean can kill you just like a bomb can kill you, but at least the ocean is not awful like bombs, or surreal like overgrown greenhouses, or alarming like the barking sounds that flushing toilets make. In elementary school, we used to have emergency civil defense drills. The lights would go out and we would rise in synchronized silence, obeying hushed orders and furtive hand signals, rustling like herds of terrified mice, if in fact it can be said that mice manifest in herds rather than as random runners. No one ever told us which particular emergency we were drilling to avoid, probably Russians then too. The thought of Russians attacking Eastern Long Island seemed unlikely, though it's true that East Hampton has beaches like the ones in Normandy, and beaches are a threshold. I asked Kate if she remembered yellow alerts. She said she did, and red ones. Didn't we have to kneel under our desks for one kind like this? And I put my head to my chest and locked my fingers around my neck. And with the other type, Kate said, we had to do the same thing, only in the hall. Right, I said with a shiver, that's so fucked up. She cupped her mouth and imitated an implausibly tranquil public address warning. It was like the European airport voice, like the one we heard at Charles de Gaulle Airport when we went to France with the French club. Sterile and cybernetic, glassy and opaque, like rocks at the bottom of a fishbowl. Kate was really good with voices. This is a yellow alert. This is a yellow alert. Remain calm and follow the instructions of your teacher. Which one is which? I said, like, what do the colors mean? Bombs, probably, she said, different styles. But a bomb is a bomb. Why would we have been any safer in the hallway than in the classrooms? Why not just stay at our desks? There was a rush of water. Kate lost her footing. I continued to speculate. They must have moved us out, 
because the classrooms had something the halls didn't have, windows. And the only reason they would have wanted us away from windows was if something was outside coming in. Kate said, Christ heavy. A land attack, gunfire, grenades, red alert, death by blood, yellow mint gas, death by bombs, nukes. Jack was always talking about the massive radiation release that was coming. The rain had passed, all that remained up above was a series of garnet streaks. The sea slapped ominously, confessing its strategic impartiality. The sea is an international sea, and the sky a universal sky. Often we forget that. Often we think that what is verging upon us is ours alone. We forget that there are other sides entirely. Kate and I waded quickly back to shore. As soon as we could, we broke free of the backward pull of waves and started running. We dressed, yanking our Levi's up over our wet legs. Sand got in, sticking awfully. Shit, she said as she scaled the dune to the parking lot. I'm never getting high with you again. <laughs> so, so do you want to start by talking a little bit about your, um, about your publishing experience, the sort of why you became self so you started by self-publishing? Yeah, I don't know that it's that. It's, I mean, I, sure, I'm happy to. I don't know if it's going to be that interesting because it costs a lot of money. It's not really it's prohibitive. It's not really a good idea. <laughs> self-publishing is fine, but... You, it, but I have a question sure. about that. What made you decide to be self-published? Or did you try to sell it before? And then did you try to find an agent and then decided to self-publish? Or did you say, oh, I'm going to self-publish that? I never tried to find an agent, and I never tried to publish it. I simply wrote it. When I was finished writing it, my ex-husband, who had a print and design company, decided to print it for me. We really, I, I did not think of publishing it. Um, and we also thought printing is really like kind of a boring business, so maybe we can make a publishing company. It's like, you know, I've got a sheet. We can make a theater in the yard. Like, let's just do it. So we thought this would be sort of the inaugural piece of that, that company, and what a great thing. We have it in hand. Um, we were naive. It's very difficult to do. We printed it, and we were fortunate in that people responded to it. It was hard to get another author who was good, who was not you know, published elsewhere wouldn't try the normal routes. Like, so we couldn't really follow it up with anything necessarily. I mean, I got a lot of submissions, but they were not, you know, they, they weren't, they might have been great, but they weren't necessarily worth the investment from my point of view because a book takes so much money, not simply to print, but also to, um, to, uh, to market and to, um, we had no distributor. I mean, we were literally making phone calls to bookstores around the country. And uh, that's a resources thing. So I constantly had 10 interns helping me ship things out. They're great. They were great. And they, they did great. But it was just really, you know, kind of always by the seat of our pants. And not something that I would want necessarily another writer to go through either. I mean, lots of people came in wanting an advance. And I was not really in a position of doing that either. So. It was like, what did we do? So then I thought, well, let me try to do something else, but it's not so labor intensive for me. I'll just edit it. And so I knew a physicist, and I thought, well, I'll just do a physics book, because when I get bored from physics, I want to look at art. And so I put art next to physics, and it turned out to be really beautiful, but that was two years off my life. So after all of this kind of publishing labor and money spent and resources, I have some neat things to show for my time, but it was not really, it was not really, it wasn't even necessarily a labor of love. It was just kind of like painted into a corner and I didn't know what else to do. So then I folded the company and <clears throat> submitted the book as it was to agents. And then uh, that's how I, I could probably could have done that a lot sooner but it, actually, um, this kind of book, it was, a, it was a thorough investigation. And I think at the time when I originally wrote it, it became, although it didn't start that way, a response to the uh, more superficial uh, uh, assessments of women, American women in particular, that were, that were popular at that time. That wasn't what I, I didn't want to contribute to that. And I felt that uh, personally, for me, it wasn't. Those were not the books I wanted to read, and also they weren't the representations of women that I wanted to um, see out there exclusively. 
but yet that was what was going. So this was a point of difference that maybe n would not have been marketable when I first finished it. And maybe in the back of my mind, I felt that I just didn't want to endure. I, don't, I can't even say that. We just really printed it. It was really what it came down to. And they're really beautiful. So, so what we did was um, do something that is an object is, is a gorgeous piece of, of art. Did you have a hard time getting published? I mean, this is a good book. Did you have a hard time finding an agent? Um, uh, no, I mean. No, you got <clears throat> Well, no, I no, I, I sent, I went to the internet, and I went. There's like some guy who lists all the names. You probably all know this crazy guy. He's, and he puts their names and addresses, and I just sent the book out to like, you know, people. And then the one I really liked was he has, you know, his initials are doubles, and my initials are doubles. And the girl was working me at double initials, and I'm like, send it to that guy. So we sent it to that guy, and then he called me, and then he said, okay, let's meet. And then we did, and then he was really nice guy. And then he said, I have a lady, I'm going to send it to you. And then suddenly I was there, going up the elevator at Random House. It was really strange. And I'm like, this is crazy. This is how people, the world works for other people, like not for me. This is what happens on a daily basis for other people. And uh, she was a nice, she was a great lady. So, so I was, I mean, I was really lucky, I think. Great. Yeah. Yes. Did the story change at all once mm -hmm. you went to random? I did. Um, I think they thought that it was, I, you know what, I don't know what they thought. Uh, the way they acted was um, that it was kind of nesty and weedy and they wanted to pare it down and kind of see the trees in the forest. So uh, that was a long process and a lot of back and forth and you know a lot of negotiation, like that one line that I have about mice being random runners, they didn't like it. <laughs> they cut it. Like, so it was like, you know, they, it was a lot of, you know, like, well, you can have that, but I get that, you know, some, by, by the end. In the beginning, it might have been like an X. But what happened was because this book grew so um, um, strangely and, you know, kind of twisted like, an, like a tree that grows on its own rather than something that's kind of wired down, it, it, it once you start to pull things, like it, it's almost like a waterbed. Like you can't put pressure there because it comes up somewhere else. So, by necessity, I actually had to write back into it. So things suddenly didn't make sense, and I found myself having to produce new content. Um, and then <clears throat> that that was I can I can that that was that was added a lot of time. So uh, I think it's just as long, but I think it's a little bit more open. about your process of um, transitioning from writing for yourself to writing for the public? Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, I'm in that transition. I'm like, oh, I don't want to say I'm suicidal, but I'm like, you know, there are a few people here who know me, and like, it's, it takes a lot of propping. It's, it's a, there's a lot of new pressure. This is how it is. So when you write for yourself, you write, and you feel pressure, and you're like, I really want to do this. I really want to make a living at this. I really want to spend this time. It's like really important to me. I'm waitressing, or I'm doing X, or I'm doing whatever. And you have this sense of feeling about it that's really important, but it's really just a sense of feeling, and there's no end on it. And rather than seeing that as a burden, I would just, to anyone who's in that position, I would say you should really see it as a luxury, because it's also, you know, it's glass half full. You don't have to be burdened by that freedom. I mean, that's freedom. So all you have to do is mind your own clock and, and be accountable to you. Suddenly there are new things. So I being the resistant person I am, I have to do battle a lot in my mind. Like, you know, uh, there are timed deadlines, there are word count deadlines. Um, I mean, I think as it goes, I've been pretty fortunate and I'm pretty lucky and, and I'm, I feel respected. Um, and I feel the people that I'm associated with are good people. But in a lot of what I, a lot of the angst I feel is of my own making. <clears throat> but I don't want to do something that's without purpose. I don't want to do something that's, I mean, the writing part, I think I have that part, but I don't want to do something that's trivial. So, uh, but also we're in a time that's kind of trivial. I mean, this is a great group of people, but I'm, readers are not necessarily wanting anything too, too weighty. So how do you do something purposeful that's not weighty? Uh, 
that's not, wait till you hear my subject matter, that's not, <laughs> that's not um, too philosophical and open, you know, or too modern, like, uh, it's, it's a lot of, you know, there are kind of a, a lot of, you know, things marching around all the time. So, uh, and then I go, I get, get really schizo, like, well, screw everybody. I don't have to, like, do, you know, I'm, <laughs> but you're really just lying to yourself. Or you're like, I'm going to die if I don't have this done by June. But that's a lie, too. So it's just a lot of people start staying really far away from you. Uh, it's, it's been, it's, it's a lot. I mean, I'm, that's not really an articulate. If you have an even more specific question, I would be happy to answer it. About no, just, I, I, I think I see the flow of what you're getting at. Uh, things that I've been trying to be th that I've been trying to think about that might be helpful. I've been trying to think of um, other kinds of articulations of the same story. So, for instance, this time, like this is a very difficult thing. Everyone always says well, it would be a great film. Yeah, except it's really complicated and it's so easy to stereotype and reduce. Like it's so easy to treat reductively that that it would not necessarily. Like I didn't think that way going into it. So it, it's a little in danger that way. So this time I'm being more mindful of how it could possibly be rendered in another format so that maybe there'll be some mortgage money in there at some point. <laughs> no, that, that's partly true, but that's not exclusively true. I mean, you, you know, it, I, I, it's about ownership, really. So, so if this were to be translated, it would be a gigantic job for somebody I don't know. And that is something I can't even Im Im imagine. So, so this time I'm trying to think about well, how would I claim it, and 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 and, and kind of um, encapsulate it in such a way that it would be easily transferred if it had to be. So, so and also, you know, I think that there's a great deficit of content. So it's possible that any products that anybody does, especially writers, would would be required to contribute to the culture at large. Is it, is it possible when you're writing for the external, like the press you talk to the public that you're writing for, to retain the same sense of joy that you had when you're writing for yourself? There's no joy. <laughs> no, there's no joy. I have no joy. I'm joyless. I'm completely joyless. It's possible to retain that same joylessness. Joy, joy, yeah, you, the joylessness, if you're feeling it, yeah, you're fine. You're good. <laughs> Just don't look no, it's a lot of lonely time. It's a lot of cerebral time. It's a lot of like, you know, uh, uh, I don't really need to go to yoga. I don't really need to get out of the house. I don't. You get like a little, and and then I think, well, those two years of comfort went by really fast, and I treated this sort of like a you know a weekend thing, and that's this is recording. I probably shouldn't say that, but not. I didn't. I was responsible, and actually, now, and I'm not backpedaling. I do appreciate the amount of work I put in, but I didn't really have a clear objective. I didn't. I, I, I had a story, and this is another thing I'll talk about. But I didn't really um, apply myself as I am now. But maybe I couldn't have. Maybe that wouldn't have been. I don't know how many people here. Like, it's not really working to deadline. It's getting so far into something that there's nothing else. And so you convince yourself of that reality. That reality becomes more convincing than the real reality. And maybe that's a by necessity step. Like maybe that's essential, an essential part of the process. I don't, I, don't, I don't think you can have a foot in both worlds. And I, th I do think a lot, not that I would ever compare myself to, to greats, but I do think of the madness of greats. Like I do think of Hemingway. I do think of like hearing stories of how Picasso painted in the middle of the night. And I always used to think, I don't know if anybody's a Picasso expert and they can bear me out on this, but I just think that's great. Wow. He could just like paint till two and then sleep all day and do and now I write till two. It's not that great. <laughs> and I don't sleep all day. I'm not Picasso, but you know, uh, there is that question of do you do it because you want to be off schedule and off time, or do you do it just because you're so far in you can't, you know, you can't back out. I think I'm at the point now where I'm further in than I am out. So I don't know, maybe it's just a necessary part of the process. Was there joy originally when you were writing the first one? Yeah, there was maybe more peace of mind. I liked being in there, but you know what? Um, it might have been too, you know, it might have been too much a place of, to, to retreat to. I mean, I was a mom, and I was there was a lot of stuff going on, so it was a it's kind of a happy, organized place for me to be. And maybe I took too much time. 
you know, maybe time is really a luxury. So, maybe, you know, whenever I see someone's like second novel or something and it's really thin, I think, what's this? But they, <laughs> I didn't get away with this. Where's the story? But now I really understand. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's like a, I, I, I don't think I'll be able to do that, but I do see now um, the, those, now that I want to be resistant to those pressures, I do see why they exist. Was it, did you find it difficult to keep your ideas on yourself separate from your ideas of teenagers at large? My ideas of myself? Um, no, I don't think I'm, you know, I think when you age, you're just basically the same person if you stay close to your essential self, if that's what you mean. Like, uh, uh, when you were writing about other teenagers, did you find it difficult <coughs> to uh, keep them from just being reflections of yourself? Oh, I see, like, sort of using them as foils for, for, for the character or for myself. No, I saw them as, they're based on people I know, so, uh, and they're based on people that I, that I, um, in this book in particular, models of people that I think are sadly gone, like really liberal people or, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, I'm sure. I mean, high school, teenager time, everyone makes light of it, but it's really political, it's really intellectual. I mean, if you have a good group of people, it can be the best time of your life and the most illuminating time of life. And everything kind of gets inverted. It's not just that you're becoming an adult, but you're also questioning everything that, uh, that makes one an adult, and do you want to take that on or not? And, and every era has its own uh, response to that exchange. So, um, so in the seventies, I think people were uh, teenagers had been really um, their consciousnesses had been raised uniformly by the nineteen sixties and by having been babies of the sixties, and also the idealism that came from you know, uh, we can do it. We can really do this. Like people talk about solar power now. and I mean, we, we thought it was like a thing already in 1978 and 70. We thought it was like, okay, this is done. Done deal. We're done. Oil? We used to talk about that. We're like, oh, this is all BS. We're going to be through this. And, you know, and then Reagan came in. Not to, <laughs> you know, I was saying, but then like everything reversed and there was like all the doors got locked again. So, you know, and, and, and being in any way because all of a sudden being liberal was being equated with being, you know, or being idealistic was being equated with being liberal, which was being equated with being a radical or counterculture, and everything was polarized, and there was no kind of soft middle that people had been, you know, operating from from a super long time, or, or, or even just for 15 years or something, from like, say, 65 to the late 70s. So uh, that all went away like a carpet pulled out. So I miss those people. And that saved me there. I mean, so we probably have time for one more question, or, um, or, or one and a half more questions. Yeah, I'll go faster in my answers. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to talk fast. Uh, for anthropology, I'm, I'm interested uh, if you could talk a little bit more about how you work your ideas about anthropology into the story, it's especially I'm thinking like. You know, there's a sort of macro view when you look, and you finish a chapter and you think, I need, I wanted to sort of uh, accomplish something in that chapter. And maybe it did or didn't have anything to do with this sort of anthropology idea. See what I mean? Like, did, yes. Did, so, was so. It micro, was it macro? Like, how did So, uh, well, the, in, 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 especially in visual anthropology, there's that, that urgency to fairness and, and, and then that, that, that considered um, uh, consideration and representation. So I tried to bring that into every moment and uh, um, not resort to easy, you know, easy answers. So whenever I hit a wall that someone else might have treated in a certain way or in a familiar way, I tried to go around it and be a little bit unfamiliar. You know, in the sentence to sentence writing, in the grand scheme, um, I tried to do an observational study. So if you're familiar with anthropology, I mean, I just tried to observe without being too, um, too uh, manipulative but also I had to have a kind of sense of intention. But I think it's missing from this. I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about it is that it's not got that cause and effect drive. It doesn't have a point A to point B or A to Z. You know, it doesn't have a linear trajectory. It's just sort of like, blah. And maybe that's the way we evolved at that time also. So in a way, it was lucky. I don't know if I could have that same kind of looseness with a different, uh, Era, a different uh, age, age group. 
So I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean, it was, yeah. I tried to be like not so, I tried not to infiltrate her space too much and also uh, let her tell her own story in a way and she's uh, got an issue with truthfulness. So some of the things that you find out in time are not actually as they happen. They happen differently later. You find out later that they're a little bit different. So that was another thing. I let her represent herself a little bit too. Tried to. Somebody over, it was, yeah, hey. Um, so uh, a few parter, sorry, it's you. Um, I was wondering if uh, the, because the way the scenes go, there's something going on and then there's a lot of asides and they're often in the same subject, but um, there's a lot of jumping. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, because the flourishes, like the, the metaphors and stuff like that, I can tell that that comes naturally, but I was wondering if you write in those other things, if that's a linear thing for you, even when it's jumping, or if you're often jumping in the way that you approach it. No, I think she was. But now that I'm working on a second book, which we didn't really get to, but it's interesting. I think it's not really, like even reading it, it's really more her than, you know, me. I mean, her her depth has to come from someplace, so she can't be your average, you know, th she's not thinking two thoughts teenager. She's really got a lot of sources, a lot of information bases, and, um, and so her mind naturally flows. And also it could be avoidance of the situation. I mean, she's just complicating something that doesn't really have to be complicated, but she's not doing it by saying, you know, what about those stockings? Or what about those, you know, she's not doing it in the normal ways that, that teenagers separate and critique and build distance and boundaries. I think that she's doing it in her mind, maybe to not be that. And I guess as a writer, maybe that was my best way of showing difference, if that's what you mean. I don't know if I would do it that way twice. Well, I was also wondering if when, when you're doing that, if it's linear for you, like you write this part and then this part and then this part, or if it was choppy for you too, going back and adding in these scenes. No. No, I think right now it came from her. And yeah, no, I think it came. I think it came that way. I think like you hit a word, and then you're like, oh, that's a thought, and then you go on that thought, and then you go back to that. And I think that that's maybe, yeah, it was based on her. And then, oh, sorry. No, I was. Oh, sorry. Question more. Um, this is the a third question. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. The, um, <laughs> when you had to change things, I was wondering if a lot of what they wanted to change was some of that jumpy, like if the beginning and end stayed intact, but it was process of, like, what was the thing that changed most? Poetry, I think. They wanted to make it less poetic. So there was a lot of, um, you know, just uh, repetitive things or, you know, this um, kind of uh, not the decorative or flourishy stuff, but I think more the, you know, uh, more of the, uh, the deeper stuff. You know, this the kind of lilting and, you know, wandering off stuff. I mean, I, that's not, I mean, there might be poets in the room. That's not net what I think is poetry, but I would classify it as, as, as different. In, 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 in fiction, this piece of fiction, I would classify that as poetry, or some of what it was as poetry. Thank you. You're welcome. Just oh, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. okay. Oh. And you can ask more questions Thank over there. Come over there. This is, I guess, union time. We have yeah, to rush. Yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> Thank you. That was just, oh, that was just great. You're welcome.